this is the way things are going. You know, people are healthier, their figures better. They can afford to expose more. I think the whole basis of fashion is is that women want to be looked at. And, uh, this, is, this is what the young people want, and it's working. Well, I wish I was sweet 16 instead of 62, so that I could be like them, just that. It's, it's very subtle, uh, which is unusual in England, not since the 18th century, I think. I think the colouring of the dresses of today are absolutely gorgeous. Everybody's amazed to find that London can produce, um, you know, jolly clothes. Mini skirts, mini skirts, mini skirts. Girls in the town roll around in those side mini skirts. This is the story of a unique insurrection, one that has induced outcries in Parliament and has set London swinging. It has caused angry editorials and worldwide bewilderment. It's about the young English generation who forgot about being angry. It's the Miniskirt Rebellion. Brought to you by Clairol, creators of the exciting natural look and beauty to help you discover your most exciting natural look. These are rebels of a different breed. The fighting uniform, stringy hair, pale makeup, short, short skirts, the dolly clothes. Their rallying cry, look as pretty as you can, create attention with your gear, wear see-through dresses, pattern stockings, wear a sincere sneer toward the conventional. How did it start this slightly mad fling? Here's one expert's opinion. Fashion editor of the London Daily Express, Deirdre McSherry. I think the feeling really came from the people, you know, from, from small girls, uh, under 18, making, running up little things for themselves. And with this kind of extra sensory perception that people in fashion have, the students who are the same age at the Royal College of Art in the design school began picking this up because they, they designed the kind of clothes they wanted to wear themselves. They didn't design clothes for Americans or copied from the French or, or sort of Hartnell type ladies. They just designed the kind of clothes they wanted themselves. And bit by bit, this whole thing, you know, grew from the people to the designers and then to shops. These are the boutiques, the little shops with groovy names where the birds are go-go. These boutiques, row upon row, exist in the friendliest competition ever recorded in the annals of commerce. The most competitive sound you hear is the wave of rock and roll music pouring out of these shops, drowning you in a sea of beetles, catching you in an avalanche of rolling stones till you get that frantic buying fever. The shop owners, mostly designers in their 20s, start with very little money, no inhibitions, and a repository of pluck. When a beautiful model and a gifted designer decided a boutique was their cup of tea, they spotted two abandoned tiny shops side by side. They planned to break down the walls, make one large shop. Forbidden by the building code, they came up with a simple solution. Open two shops jointly owned in competition with themselves. And that's how Top Gear and Countdown coexist. The owners, Karen Booth and James Wedge. And so the majority of our clothes um, are um completely for this boutique alone. We don't sell anywhere else. Which, which is the way most boutiques run, I think. Yeah. I think the reason for this is because um, 
when boutiques started opening, they couldn't, they couldn't get the clothes from the manufacturers that they wanted. They couldn't get the skirts as short as, as the young girls yes. wanted. So they had to make them themselves. There was no, no other way of doing it. Bieber's, dark as a nightclub, defying all conventional retailing rules, is one of the most popular shops in London. Many skirts, hats, shoes, bracelets, earrings, sunglasses, anything to make you a mad mod can be found in this diminutive department store, and all in tune with the out-of-tune Big Beat music. <music> Top models like Twiggy never tire of seeing mirrored images of themselves in new shapes, new fabrics, new colors, even new postures. These faces incredibly beautiful everywhere. In this new scene, everyone is a potential Julie Christie. Everyone just a beat away from a million seller recording. It's now difficult to find those once famous English tweed suits, those practical shoes, the hairdresser who wouldn't think of making you less dowdy. The Beatles started this youthful British independence. It caught fire and now this new freedom a total break from English tradition is the now way of life. If any single person is credited with starting this revolution in clothes habits, it's the designer owner of Bazaar, a five-foot business tycoon doing over $10 million a year, honored by her country with the Order of the British Empire and spokesman for the Big Beat generation, Mary Quant. Uh, well, when I started, um, I, straight after being an art student, and uh, I just hated clothes the way they were in England, and I hated the sort of pompousness and the stuffiness of the whole thing, and wanted clothes that were more like art students' clothes, really. You know, sweaters, dresses that felt like sweaters, and easy clothes. And um, I suppose I hated and resented the, uh, the sort of stiff, formal, uh, businessman's um, suitings and the formality of English clothes. And um, really, it was a case of sort of more or less where fools step in. We were pig headed enough and, and almost sort of foolish enough um, to, to, to go ahead and do this. And we just thought there were enough sort of art student friends and people in Chelsea who would like it. But um, never believed that people would come from all over London and then Americans to take these things back to the States to manufacture. and. In fact, people from all over the world. I thought it was just for Chelsea. I, I couldn't be more surprised. This surprise has grown to a major shock. Shocking when you catch on how easy it is to make money. To cash in on the craving of these kids who spend an average of 75% of their salaries on clothes. The clothes are delivered and grabbed off the racks immediately in staggering volume sales that make American department store owners wince. I'm Maurice Jeffery. We started this shop about a year and two months ago. The shop is called The Shop, and it's 47 Radnor Walk, Chelsea, the famous Chelsea, of course, uh, London, England. We do lots of evening things, you know, things for uh, evening time, cat suits in lace, lined, um, you know, evening trousers, evening tops, which we actually sell to America for sort of cocktail parties and for, you know, evening dinner parties, that sort of thing. Well, I design all the clothes, but I have... Uh, three factories that make up for me. I send to them a drawing and a, a rough pattern which they pull to shape and then make the garments up. It's very simple really because the young people themselves tell you what they want, you know what I mean? They come into the shop and they say, why don't you do trousers with great flares? Why don't you do, you know, tops coming down to the navel? And then you go ahead and you do it, you see. You do it and maybe limit it slightly, you, you know, do an abbreviation on it and then suddenly you've got something that's very sellable. Wow! look at that skirt! Here are the test pilots of the latest. Will this gear hold up under actual battle conditions? That moment when you descend upon no man's land, the discotheque. Wow, who's that chick in the miniskirt? The 
social moments often interrupt during business hours. Sure, we'll make the sale, but right now it's more important to learn the newest dance variation. The prevailing attitude is always lighthearted. Well, this is, this is fun because it was exciting. You know, we started this. I started this originally with a, a girlfriend of mine who is now uh, a fashion editress of a magazine. And we started this as a daft sort of joke. You know, it started off, we made one or two hats and one or two bags. We sold to Merrick, one to Simpsons, Piccadilly. These are very big stores here, you know, people that are well established. And uh, it went very well. We did a great promotion thing for S&H stamps, you know, pink stamps over here. And it was fairly lucrative, so we thought, we'll have a go at this. We'll try and, uh, and start a little shop and sell the sort of things that we make for them and sell them ourselves, you see. And it worked. With the first week alone, the first two days alone, we took a fantastic amount of money. And we, we just ran out of stock, so we had to make four times the amount and get cracking. We sold in from this shop alone, which is about 10 feet square, 3,500 of one suit in three weeks, which is quite, quite something. When the Quants and the Morris Jefferies are old hat, where will the new designers spring from? The kids who will raise hemlines and raise eyebrows the next time. Probably from here. A school where only 15 students out of 400 applicants are admitted each year. These are Britain's most talented future designers. They experiment, they create, and they're a source of fresh ideas. A costume plucked from a tropical bird to coat a pretty London bird. Nylon gets a new treatment. More stretch added to show the curves. The American influence scores a hit. Baseball has its day. This time on the playing fields of Eton. Arctic camouflage influenced this student creation. Somehow it doesn't seem to hide much here. The kids anticipated the big French fashion of the Russian influence with this Boris Godunov-inspired evening coat. Bizet's Carmen turns pop up with these culottes, proving that the habanera and the frug can live side by side peacefully. King Arthur is suddenly launched into the space age with a miniskirt dress and hat welded from bottle caps. Colorful, shaggy, bright, right for partying or at home. A trio of ideas in one. Bikinis, pajamas, and resort outfit. Made from readily available five and 10 cent store kitchen curtains. Janie Ironside, principal of the school, was asked how much her school has influenced commercial designers. They've influenced them almost too much. And that's why I've, you know, rather wrinkled my brow when you use this expression, swinging London. Because where it was genuine swinging, and still is to a certain extent, a great many of the commercial designers have taken it up and really are making a joke out of it. All this is no joke to a new star on the horizon, Susan Locke, another model, designer, boutique owner, another one of the pretty people making good. This one, which is made of acrolan, acrolan lace, and you can see right through it. It's for dancing and wearing at a discotheque. And this is ostrich. It sells at 12 guineas, um, which is um, $36. This one, this one, again, you can see right through it. But it's much more of a day dress. This has gone very well sold a lot of those, but you could also dance in it. This one is made of string. The sort of string that you knit dishcloths out of. And you can see right through it. And you have to wear a body stocking underneath it so that it looks decent. And most girls wear these to dance in at discotheques.
Dolly's, Sibella's, Annabella's, the Scotch, the discotheque of the week. This is what it's all for. Come on in. Show off the new dress, the new pattern stocking. Bring the boyfriend, the one who's been with you all day at bazaars or beavers. This is the social climax to cap the boy-girl shopping sprees. Tricky cute names are the name of this new merchandising game. The harassed husband paying the bills for his wife's clothes may have the feeling that fashion changes every month. This is not quite true. The United States has trailed England by six months in the acceptance of the short skirt. Now the hemlines are going up. The miniskirt is in. Paraphernalia shops like these in New York and in Los Angeles are springing up in the U.S. Taken from the London mold, but compressed into something peculiarly American, they are posher, have more costly decor, dramatic color schemes, and trained, carefully chosen salesgirls who reflect the mood, often more glamorous, more chic than the customer. A new era, the spender trying her darndest to look like the salesgirl. Jean Chacobes, popular with the young set and movie stars, is making its mark in Beverly Hills. Jill, hi. Gee. How are you? It's fun. It's nice to see you. Listen, I'm glad you came in. Percy Hammond said, the female knee is a joint, not an entertainment. Many still have not made up their minds. Jill St. John seems to reflect the attitude of the cautious American, the one who's still not quite sure. Oh, gee. Well, it's only about uh, three inches short in the other ones, and you've got the legs to wear I know, it. that's like seven inches above the knee. Let's get with it. Try it on. It's great for you, really. You've got the legs. Yeah, I like it. Okay. Try it on. You know I can't keep steady. Carefree, gay, paying 70, 80, 100, or 200 dollars is no longer an awesome decision. It's as casual as picking a chocolate from a big candy box and then selecting two or three more because they look so good. Look at the length on you. I think it's, it's too short. No, you have great legs and it'll look great. Really, uh, take a look at it. No, my knees aren't that good. Well, I have this one. It's no, a little that's longer. That's too long. <laughs> no, I think it's great. Really, take a look. What happens when you sit down? Um, <laughs> Hi, love. She got my eye passing by, and she knew it too. A tough Tuesday, everyone. Young starlet Chris Noel is one of Hollywood's trendsetters. Chris, seriously dedicated to her job as a disc jockey for Armed Forces Radio Network, looks the way a girl should look in the mirror. As soon as I hear from you, I'll answer and I'll send you a photo, okay? Now, here's another current big hit stateside. Plastic squares, vinyl, string, sequins, boulder prints, clashing colors, Today, you've got to have a gimmick to get the attention in newspapers, Vogue, or Harper's Bazaar. Here's Tim Galfus, a top fashion photographer, working on a magazine layout for what some experts consider tomorrow's big trend. The electric dress. Yes, a dress that not only lights up, but can be adjusted to the rhythm of the music.
modeling her own creation, Diana Dew, the Thomas Edison of clothes designers. This is the popular PJs in Hollywood. In the United States, as in England, the focal point for showing off the latest fashions is the discotheque. It's all action. It's plastic. It's pop art. It's music. It's Buck Rogers all entwined. It's the 21st century. And it's the now thing. It started in London. It's beginning to sweep through the United States. What's the future? Is this rebellion totally destined to annihilate convention, or will it die? Uh, this is very difficult, because at the moment they're at the absolute pinnacle of success, and it's very hard to see how they can do better than this. So I think there will be a, a slight um, retrenching, because uh, it's big business now, and they can't afford to take the same chances as they could, really, up to six months ago. I think this will um, uh, keep English fashion at the top, but it'll ha they'll have to be more solid, you know, more, more, uh, more like fashion in New York, I'm afraid. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if we just keep our senses. I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't go on for a very long time. I mean, but the trouble is that partly, may I say, due to over-enthusiasm from America, it's encouraged people to go dotty over here. And, um, you know, the fact that everything is interesting in Carnaby Street makes people think, oh, all right, then I'll cash in quickly while I can. Which I don't think is the way that English fashion will work. I mean, I think we can be as light-handed as anybody else. We don't have to make fools of ourselves. Well, I, I, I think we've, we've now faced the fact that we live in a mass production age, and we're pleased about it. And um, we, we make no apologies for um, um, not wearing or designing with designers' couture clothes. And so I think we want to use um, all the new processes, the new uh, fabrics that can be made, work with scientists. They're going to become part designers, too. We've all got to work together on this. I think um, clothes uh, must be simplified and, and be gay, wearable, feasible, reasonably cheap and yet well put together. And I think that we can, we can, for instance, tidy up with all those horrible gaps and mouse traps, you know, to hold your stockings up. And obviously that there must be tights, um, which maybe even go straight into the shoe, you know. You, you wash the whole thing at night and sling it out to dry. And um, there's either like a second skin or that it should be um, part of fashion, like, like um, children's, like little girls' knickers are made to match their dresses, that there should be a whole fashion thing, that we have sort of um, almost like Bermudas underneath our dresses which relate in design and colour. And maybe even this becomes such fun and so much part of fashion that we take of our dresses indoors, you know, or at the weekends, you know, and, and underwear becomes um, informal wear, as dresses are to coats. The Miniskirt Rebellion was brought to you by Clairol, creators of the exciting natural look and beauty to help you discover your most exciting natural look. Mini skirts, mini Twiggy, 17 years old. Her style, her makeup, her look have made her the world's number one model. Mary Quant has said, never before have the young set the pace as they do now. Once only the rich, the established set the fashion. Now it is the inexpensive little dress seen on the girls on High Street. The mini skirt has swept London, conquered Paris, devastated Amsterdam, and stopped traffic on the Via Veneto. Get ready. High Street seems to be coming to Main Street. When she smiled at me, it was plain to see. From that shapely hip to that shapely knee.
when she smiled at me, it was plain to see.